first speaker is Francesc, and he talks about Swiss law, Hips law, and Project Total Law. So, thank you very much. Thanks for showing up today. Uh, I think it's a great panel. I mean, great. almost everyone is here, so thank you. Uh, so, I will present myself a little bit. For those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm Francesc, I'm from Barcelona. I used to be a mathematician, uh, which means that my background is mathematics, but then in my PhD, my advisor was Alvaro, who was a physicist, so I kind of was trained in a physicist world. And now, after my PhD with Alvaro, I moved to Italy, and I'm in this center for complexity in biosystems, and I work with biologists, so I'm drifting away and away and away from mathematics, and to the point where I usually get lost in mathematics talk, like everybody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the truth. <laughs> it's like that, yeah. But I mean, I still remember my background. Uh, okay, so most of the work I will present was done with my PhD, and so I have to thank Alvaro, and he is responsible for everything. So, so everything is in collaboration with Alvaro, and this will be very classic talk, I guess. Uh, for a statistics of language workshop is a very classic topic, so Zip's law and Hibbs law, which I guess are probably the most famous laws, perhaps, I don't know, you could agree, in, in quantitative linguistics. So you might say, you know, it's been studied so much, what, what, what else can you say? I hope I can say something about them. Uh, so I will talk about Zip's law. I will say a few things, right? Hips uh, law as well. About Zip's law, I will explain that there's two representations. Everybody knows that, right? So I will just comment on that a little bit. And whether or not they are equivalent, and so on. This is, uh, seems a trivial issue, but it's created some, some confusion sometimes. <coughs> I, will, I think I will not talk about my work exponents, so there's I think I deleted this part, but this is about how do you feed power loss properly and so on, but perhaps there's no time for that. I will talk about sample size issues, so about the problem of having text of different size, how do you compare them and so on. It's not trivial, it's not very complicated, but it's, there's been also a great deal of controversy about that. And then I will show some results in a large-scale analysis, meaning testing Zip's law in a real large data set, which is something that, as far as I know, uh, nobody did before, and I don't know why, because you know, the, the books are out there, it's very easy to write a script that processes you know, 10,000 books, so why don't we test Zip's law in a systematic way in a large data set? <coughs> About Hibbs law, I will explain that there's two interpretations, so two representations for Zip's law and two interpretations for Hibbs law. So it's kind of messy when you say, oh, Zip's law implies Hibbs law, right? So what do you mean exactly? This is not, you know, you have to be a little bit specific, otherwise we don't know exactly what you're saying, right? And I will try to, to convince you that the empirical evidence for Hibbs law, at least in one of the interpretations, is weak. And We'll, we'll see if you agree with me or not. Uh, I will then talk about how it relates to Zip's law, and this is something that it's been rediscovered a number of times, and everybody's getting to the same results. And I will try to convince you that something funny is going on, and at least in some interpretations, and we'll see. So if you don't agree, you, you interrupt me and say, oh, Frank, what are you doing? It's all wrong, you fix it all wrong, please. <laughs> Uh, and then if I convince you, uh, I will make a proposal for an alternative for Hibbs law, and let's see what you think. And all these, which is uh, sort of classic topics, what I have tried is to <coughs> test this with some large data sets, uh, with rigor and with large data sets. Uh, and I'm talking about Project Gutenberg, 
and also Google and Android. Okay, so this is all very simple. So two representations for Zipflow. So Zipflow version one, let's say, works like that. Okay, so you get your text, you count how many times each word appears in the text, you get the frequencies, and then you sort them in decreasing order and assign ranks. You know, so the most common word has rank one, the second has rank two, and so on. This is actually the formal definition of the rank. And then the Zip's law in this formulation says that the frequency is a power law of the rank. And I'm using the exponent beta for this version one. Zip law. So <coughs> nothing mysterious here. Okay, then the second version of Zip's law is the frequency representation. So you count the words again and then you compute the distribution of the frequencies or the probability mass function. So how many words have certain frequency? So you do the statistics twice, right? You have the frequencies and then the frequencies, the frequencies. Right, so we know this. So <coughs> and then in this in this formulation, Zip's law would be a power law for the frequencies with an exponent gamma. Of, of course, there's many, let's say, modifications of Zipf's law, and you can propose more complicated functional forms, but this is the, the most basic formulation. Great. <coughs> and so, are they equivalent? Well, in a continuous approximation, if you want, yes, they are, and it's kind of very easy to see this. So, this is the approximation, okay? So, you turn this sum into an integral, and from there you just take the derivative, blah, 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 <coughs> and you get to this relation, okay? And this has been rediscovered many times. <coughs> and it's taken for granted, and, and I agree, this is true in, an, in this approximation. And the question is to remember that there was this approximation, and so perhaps sometimes, depending on what you're doing, this is fine. And perhaps not. You just need to remember that there was this approximation. So there's no controversy, but if you forget that you did this, depending on what you're measuring, perhaps the equivalence breaks down. Uh, Frances, so your n are the counts or are the normalized frequency here? So counts. Counts, which is yeah. the absolute frequency. So then you don't understand how can you approximate it, how can you integrate over an integer so it's so it's a continuous approximation. Mm -hmm. You yeah. take the frequencies as continuous. Right. If you normalize the frequencies, is it more natural or it, does it play any difference or no, no? If you normalize the frequency, so you have really the frequencies, so then you have, so you don't have integers, you have you know, real numbers, but you, you, they are not continuous, right? Yeah. right. Oh, yeah, yeah. So just if, if, if this, if, is this, Important here, no, no. no. I think the, the uh, I think it should be equivalent. It's equivalent. No, at this level, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it makes a difference if you work with relative frequencies. It's probably better. But the reason to continue with that in part is that the law has been formulated in this way and has been studied in this way and reported in this way, and so. <laughs> So we know we could do things better, but we carry on with this perhaps and, and then you know, work out what, what can go wrong. But yeah, that's approximation. You know, these are integers, and you say, oh, I think it's not important. I can do an integral. You know, it's the same. But it's an approximation, right? Okay. And then, if you don't do any approximation, are they equivalent? No, of course. So, I mean, if you have a power law in the ranks, then in the frequencies, you don't have exactly power law, you have this. And this is asymptotically power law, but it's not exactly power law. Right? And the other way around, if you have a power law in the frequencies, the ranks are not exactly power law, they have an asymptotic tail, but it's not exactly power law. So you either have a, a perfect power law in ranks or in frequencies, not, not both things at the same time. <coughs> okay, so that's one thing. Now, the thing with 
zips exponent and sample size. <laughs> so the question that you might ask is if the exponent depends on your sample size. And so that you have to be specific about the question. For instance, in a collection of books, so you take many books, you measure zips exponent, and then you look at the dependency between the exponent and the text length, and it appears that perhaps there is a dependency. Uh, this is Project Gutenberg books, <coughs> and you, you see a trend here, right? The question remains to be studied if this is a real effect or it's a fitting artifact, because the problem is that you're assuming you have a power law. If, if your book doesn't have a power law, you, even, you fit something anyway. <coughs> so it's, but in this sense, I agree, we see an effect here. <coughs> However, <coughs> in a single book, <coughs> I think we should not. And what does it mean in a single book? So this is something that has been done. People take a book, then they take uh, you know, the first 100 words, the first 1,000 words, they take you know, subsets of the book of increasing length, and they measure its exponent as, as you go increasing your, your sample. And, and then I think you should not have a dependency. But there is. <coughs> oh, well, that, that's in the book, right? Well, but in his book, there is a dependency within a book. He shows, he comments on a dependency between right. the exponent and, and the length of the prefix that you take of right. the sequence. And right. So the so the thing is, I think that does, that is not uh, possible. So if you have a dependency depending on the sample size that you get, then this is a problem with your fitting or not. We will see. Okay. I will try to convince you that with. Some assumptions. This is this cannot be okay. And so th this is the, the classic plot. So you take this is Harry Potter, seven volumes all together, okay. And this is the complete book, let's say. And here n means how many parts I made of the book. So 500 means I take the book 500 bits, and then I take the first one. And so this is the distribution. So when you look at this from far away, you say, yeah, you know, it's drifting, the exponent seems to change, all right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and this has, has created all the controversy, right, this kind of plot. And actually, Zip uh, already said that, okay, so if you read this book, which is a fantastic book, uh, he says the slope is positively correlated with the size of the sample, okay? Uh, his slope is the rank representation slope. So that, that makes sense. And, and he actually measures the slopes and counts words by hand and computes the correlation between the slope and the sample size and he gets these, these correlations. Okay? But he was not very much worried about this because he uh, believed in, in some idea of the optimum size. Okay? So this is very interesting. What is the optimum size? is that when the sample size is just right, not too long and not too short, okay? <laughs> and so if you believe in this, then you kind of, you know, skip the problem. You know, this is not a problem, because he says, you know, uh, it's a steeper than the smaller samples, such as we might expect if the larger samples were overshooting the optimum size, okay? And then he goes on and says, since we're interested in samples of optimum size, we might concentrate on the samples of whatever, you know, 2,000 words. So it's great, you know, you have this dependency and you say, no, but this is overshooting, this is undersampling and the optimum size is this one. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's all right, he was a pioneer, I mean, he was doing this by hand, so. Uh, but he, he noticed that already. <coughs> and later on, I'm sure many more people, but also Minhagen uh, <coughs> and Bernhardson and collaborators published this paper and others, and they propose something like this, okay, so it's a power law with an exponential cutoff and an exponent that depends on the sample size. And they say it goes from two down to one when L, L increases. <coughs> and this is very strange from a <coughs> physics point of view, if you are into critical phenomena, these things, so if your exponent depends on the sample size, then you don't really have an exponent. Okay, uh, I mean, if gamma of L is any function, then this is just rewriting 
your function. So, but well, they showed this and they were very successful. So then we write another paper uh, with a different proposal that I will explain now. <laughs> and it's different, and they didn't like it very much. Okay, so they write a comment, and then you write a reply. And then it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a, I mean, I, I don't want to talk about all this, but this is, there's this word I'm going for years, and I hope it will finish soon. Uh, <coughs> but also, for instance, uh, Gerla, uh, so Edward and Artin, although they didn't talk about this, but I just noticed, you know, there's this plot where, so if I correct me if I'm wrong, hey, this is the exponent that you fit here, and it seems to decrease with time. But I think time is related to the sample size, right? So. <laughs> the sample size is increasing in the Google Ngrams corpus, and apparently I also see the effect a little bit. So more sample size, your exponent is decreasing here. So this seems to also happen in Google corpus. <coughs> but this is different. This is not taking one book and making parts of the book. This is mm -hmm. different books. Because this is the other plot in which it is more stable than this plot below. What again? What is the plot below? Uh -huh. Oh, this is the, the other parameter. So, so this the is the cutoff, right? The, 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 and this is more stable, yeah. Okay, and so I will explain my proposal, uh, what we did. Uh, I think it's quite simple. Uh, so you get a single, a very simple assumption, which is this one. So what is this? So when you have your text that changes width size, you know, in principle, the, the, the rank is a function of the frequency, it depends on L. And we say, yeah, it depends, but in, in this way. So this is an assumption. And what is this saying? This is saying, if your relative frequency doesn't change, then your rank will not change. OK, so we are saying the ranks are stable for the relative frequencies, not for the absolute frequencies, <coughs> which makes sense. Okay? If I double the sample size, my relative frequency does not change in, in this, under these uh, hypotheses, and so my rank doesn't change. So you could stop here and say, okay, you know, but, but if you just derive from here what this implies for the original distribution of frequencies, and, and there's, it's very simple, you just get the derivative, <coughs> you get this, so these and these are the same things, so this is equivalent, and, what? Well, there's the continuous approximation again, but, uh, and so, you go from something that's trivial or that's your assumption, and it would be so simple, to, to this form that is, is not totally evident. And this is just a scaling law, right? A scaling form. <coughs> and so this was our proposal. And, and you notice that G, I don't specify G, so it could be a power law or it could be a, a, a Weibull or an exponential or a Gaussian even, okay? I'm just saying, <laughs> that this is the scaling form. And so I don't need, I don't have said nothing about zip going in a sense, okay? It's just about how things scale. And how do you test for this if you don't know G? So it's, you do a data collapse, okay? So if I put this factor on the other side, so sorry, B is the vocabulary. <coughs> and then I plot N over L on the X axis and everything else on the other side. I should see G, okay? And so I do this for different lengths, and if I get a collapse of my data, so everything is on top of each other, I see a single function, then I say, okay, you know, this is G, and the scaling uh, holds. And so, for instance, this is the, well, and, sorry, and one thing to notice is that then if G is a power law, the exponent cannot change with L. There's, there's nothing, there's no room for the exponent to depend on L under this scale. <coughs> and so this is the previous plot. And if you do this rescaling, things collapse quite nicely. And you can say this is just doing the distribution of relative frequencies, okay? I mean, there's no mystery here. But I think it shows that your exponent, if you have an exponent, cannot change with sample size. You know, everything is on top of each other. So if this is a, a power law or not, it's another you know, discussion. But it cannot, I don't think it depends. Is the distribution of relative frequency that actually you have to rescale by the size of the vocabulary? <coughs> yeah, I think if you start with relative frequencies, 
and compute the distribution. No, okay, you still have the this factor. How about the rank frequency? Rank frequency is good. So if you do relative frequencies and ranks, it's the you get the collapse out of the box. Yeah, so we should just do this right. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's much more simple, I know, right? We have been doing just check, but uh, yeah, absolutely. But I'm not saying this is not relevant. Just right, uh, just check. Yeah, but if you, for for some reason, want to work with distribution of frequencies, then so that's the risk scaling that that, that that you have to do in this case. <coughs> and then we tested this uh, with with this some text, and and you see. You see this effect, oh, the exponent is changing, yes, no, I don't know, okay. You collapse things, when you do this rescaling, everything is on top of each other, and so so we, we conclude that the exponent does not change with sample size here. <coughs> then you, you can also test it in, in the Google Engram data set, it's huge, and this is the original paper. There's some debate on the suitability of, of, of this data set. Uh, this is the paper. This is much nicer to read in wired. Okay? And the kind of problems uh, are, you, you see some funny things like the frequency of FAC uh, for some reason does this. It's very strange and this seems to be related to OCR scanning and the issue with the long F and the S. <coughs> I mean, I'm not an expert, but I think it has to do with that. So. There's mistakes in, in the scanning and recognition of characters because of how the S and the F were printed and, and so you, you get this strange change, okay? You also get this increase of, of the representation of scientific terms, okay? So there's all this scientific literature that enters into Google engrams around here and, and so this is clear figure without capital letter. It's a stable and this is increasing and this makes so this rescales everything else, and you know, as a consequence, in part, it seems like we talk less and less about autumn, which I don't think so. It's right. So it's, it seems that the scientific literature is increasing in proportion in, in the corpus, and so then, depending on your study, you can be full, right? In this effect. So. Oh, but I, I don't know. So the, I understand the criticism for the OCR <laughs> error and. Uh, indeed, the data be, uh, before 1800 is very unreliable. Yeah. But everything else you, you describe, I think, uh, are uh, very much in line with the original idea of the science paper that this is s reflecting some societal change that you can use this database to, to investigate, investigate this? culture. This? Yeah. But how about this? Are well, we maybe, we are, maybe we are less worried about the weather. I don't know. But to, it's, uh, yeah, because of global warming, uh, <laughs> autumn has disappeared. <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's not a, a statement about the astronomy or the weather. It's about a statement of how society uh, uh, right. values these, these, these things. So I, I don't see this as necessarily a problem. No, no, it's not. I'm not neither the figure, right? So in no, the this is a science paper. This is an observation no. that, that you know the yes, but I think I think you know depending on what you study, if if you really think that we are talking less, the question is, you think we are talking less about autumn or not? not but I, okay, I think perhaps is that this thing is rescaling the total frequency. And so yeah, this is a very large number. This is what you're saying, 0.02 percent. Uh, yeah, and so this is an order of magnitude below. And so they are saying autumn is not decreasing; it's just less in proportion to the rest of the body. So this is a decrease. Okay. Well, I mean, well, well, so you see, there's some controversy. Yeah, no. no just no, 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 with, with fault, for example, maybe there's more American literature in the in the corpus now, so it's more fault than autumn, but it's the same. I don't know, I'm not an expert in corpora. Um, I just know that, so this has been used a lot but by everyone because you know it's easy, you get it on the internet and then some people perhaps that work with more classic curated corpus uh, have said, oh, you know, this is, is so wrong and so on. So, but I think, I mean, I've used it and I think there's, there's a lot that we can do there. Anyway, so, okay, we, go a little bit faster. 
so the, the comes increase exponentially. So what I'm doing is equating time with the length of, of the of the text. And so you have one scaling law for the one grams and for two grams. It's exactly <coughs> the same. And right, so this is for unigrams and this is for bigrams, right? Bigrams. And when you scale things, bam. So this is the plot that you usually do with relative frequencies. If you look here, you might say, oh, it's, well, it's changing. I don't think so, right? Everything is really very stable. <coughs> OK. Then, something else. Uh, right, the Project Gutenberg database. So if, I guess everybody knows Project Gutenberg. So you go to this website, you say, welcome. We have 54,000 books for you, OK? It's all uh, on, in the public domain, so it's no copyright issues in principle. So you can just get all of them and process them and work with them. And I think we should be doing this uh, in a more systematic way. This is how the length distribution of the books looks like, OK? So we have from very short books up to here, so 10,000 words, more or less stable, and then it, it, it goes down. So you don't have that many large books, OK? <coughs> and when I downloaded it, there was 45,000 45, on it. And of which 37,000 I could deal with, you know? And <coughs> <coughs> what we do here, you fit a power law to all of them with, uh, you know, very, very carefully, let's say. and. Yeah, in, in this study, sorry, the end mean, so the cutoff uh, was fixed to one, okay? But you could extend this and do for any end mean. And so when you do this and you look at the p-values, so you don't see a uniform distribution of p-values, which means that not all books are power law, of course, but quite a few are. And well, we were dealing with three different versions of zip law, uh, that's are the simplest ones with, with one single exponent. It doesn't really matter that much now. The result, as this was shown before, is that when you increase the text length, uh, you start to reject more and more books. And so that has to do with what we were talking about, p-values and so on. But still, I think it's interesting to see that for not very long books, you, 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 you reject, as, uh, you accept quite a lot. I mean, I think it's quite surprising that uh, here 60% of, of, of your books pass the test. And, and so you cannot reject that they are a power law. And this is just a simple power law with one exponent and no, no other parameters. So I think <coughs> it's not that bad that half of the books can be described. Mr. Question, do you yeah. have an idea of the, of the power of this test for Pure power laws? No. What do you mean the power of the test? The power uh, in the sense that so you're using some test to, to get a p value there. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is a physical test and you can still say how good it is at detecting real power law. So if you feed a simulated power law and you do the test, how many times you're going to be able to recover the real power law given the decision by so p values? Because uh, in, in principle you don't know whether you are you have uh, you're not rejecting that just because of a power issue or because there is a real power law, right? Yeah, it depends on the alternative hypothesis. I mean, no, yeah. we would. We, oh, okay. So you're using a likelihood yeah. ratio test here. We are, we are, we feed by maximum likelihood, and then uh -huh. you of the test. If you want to know the power of the test, you want you need to know the alternative hypothesis. I mean, it depends if you test against an exponential or against a log normal or something. So the no, 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 yeah, but maybe what, what you expected it might be that taking you no know, exponentials or you know, or or power like distribution how how it works, right? I think it's your 
Is it your question? Yeah, I, I was I was, I was only about that, and also the, the uh, rate of false positives, right? In in the true power law, the the, <coughs> the p value is flat. Right, so. Oh yeah, this is for sure. The, yeah. uh, but this is, I mean, if you if you construct, you you're, you're fitting uh, an p value calculation properly, and this is, is done properly, then for a discrete power law, and you also fit the minimum value and the cutoff. So if I simulate power laws and I test them, my p value is uniform, and so I get five percent of right. positive or whatever I said. Right. I mean, there's no FDR correction or anything here. I was very young, and I, I'm not sure if I should use FDR correction. I could set no. false positive no, for, for your purpose, no. right? No. So, uh, yes. In which extent in this fitting are you using the, your rescaling? So okay. are you fitting the frequency distribution? Yeah. Or? So I would change many things about, about that work, right? Okay. So do you agree that is then? Yeah, there's okay. we are fitting the frequency distribution and we here we take the full power law. So from one up to all the way. So if you deviate a little bit for n equals one, you know, you are off. So it's, it's very strict in this sense. I don't allow n to move, the cutoff is fixed at one. And so there's many other things that, that one can do. But I think it's remarkable that still with these very strict requirements, you know, like, what's that? It's, I mean, it's not bad, right? 40% rejected, so 60% passed the test. So there's some false positive, but this is, I think it's remarkable. If C could see this, he would be very happy, right? But, but his magic number is 2,000, no? Where is his magic length? Yeah, exactly. So where is it? Mm. Oh, <laughs> but that was for speech. For speech. Right? Yeah, he was also looking at speech of, of children and so on. So anyway, so that was that was something really. Uh, okay, Gibbs law. So there was two representations for Gibbs law. And we know they are different a little bit. They are, they are not equivalent totally. Okay. And now Gibbs law, what happens with Gibbs law? Gibbs law should be very simple, right? It's the vocabulary as a function of the text length. It's how, how, how the number of different items you have grow, grows when you have more items, right? But I think you can think of it in two ways. So for a fixed book, you know, you start reading and you count how your vocabulary is growing as you read. This is one thing. And the formulation would be that this growth is a power law, okay? So this is Moby Dick, and you say, ah, more or less, okay? Some bending, but okay. Something different, I think, is in a collection of documents. So you get all these books, and for each book, you only look at the total length and the total vocabulary, and you put one dot in your plot, okay? And that's another interpretation. So Hitch law has been studied in this way as well. <coughs> And for instance, this is all of Project Gutenberg. And well, okay, this is so. This is what you get. I know with Wikipedia it looks better, actually. You got there's all the languages mixed here, so you can see this. I think this is Finnish or something like that. So, <coughs> but my point is, do we agree these are two different things, right? These are only the same. But if you think in a generative model where, you know, a growing text cannot be distinguished from the ensemble of text in a way, you know, so if you do a very large text, but in, with my data, these are different things. And so sometimes when you look at the papers about the relation between zips and heaps, you're not sure what's the representation they're using, they're changing from one to the other because they are equivalent. And you're not sure what's the interpretation of Kips law, okay? <coughs> All right. <coughs> so now I want to show you this, yeah. So thinking about Kips law as the growing of my vocabulary in a single book, okay? I, I want to show you that the empirical evidence is very weak. And so I will show some plots. So you see this is Moby Dick again, my friend Bernd uh, This is the growth. And you know, you say this is a power law. I don't know, this looks bent to me. Uh, do you think this is a straight line? <laughs> not, not perfectly, you can you say, okay, it's a good approximation. So okay, let's leave it there. Another one, Lou 2010, you see it? 
Yeah, it's again it's spending a little bit, right? So again, but and this is consistent. I mean, I don't find plots where I see a straight line. I always see a bending. This is by in 2016. Here at least they say there's two power laws. <coughs> But still, it's not power law, it's bending again, right? Yes. Do you agree this is bending? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. It's bending, right? And so, I want to show that I'm not cherry picking. You know, this is, you I did this one, okay? It's bending again. It seems that it's always bending, and always more or less in the same way. Uh, Maria Angela Serrano, again mm -hmm. bending, okay? And so, I don't know why we keep saying this is a power law, and putting straight lines on top of curve, uh, things when this is happening all the time consistently. This doesn't look as a power law to me, okay? <coughs> Even, oh, look, this is great. We see how nicely average growth can be fit by a power function. You see how nicely it can be fit with a hundred elements, you see? This is ridiculous. This is, this is not a straight line, right? So I think we can do better. That was my point. Yeah? So when I was in my PhD, seeing these plots all the time, I said, this is always bending, Alvaro, come on. This is, you know, I'm not cherry picking. But I don't know, if, if you know of examples of a single book where the vocabulary grows really as a power law, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be happy to, to see them. I've never seen them. Oh, another one. Okay, blue 2010, again, you see, bending again. <coughs> and actually, if you take these two, for instance, I think that these two look more similar to each other than similar they are to, to a straight line, okay? And I made this experiment, actually, if you... This is the worst slide ever, okay? But if you take one plot and put the other on top of it, <laughs> you see? <coughs> ah, come on! I, mean, I know, it's a, I'm, I'm cheating, okay? It's not perfect, but they, they look similar. The bending is similar, okay? Okay, sorry about that, yeah? That's right, that's right. But you see, the, the bending is consistent, I always see it, and, and it seems like it's always the same thing. <coughs> okay, so now I go back to the relation of zips and hips. Okay, so from zips to hips, though, it's been rediscovered a thousand times, okay? Or six or seven at least, okay? But yeah, six or seven is, is, is many, right? Yeah. And so I have two representations for zips, though. And two interpretations for Hibbs law. So, what do you mean from zips to Hibbs? Okay, you have to be a little specific, right? Okay. So, with the continuous approximation between the two representations of zips law, <coughs> according to all these people, including, including us, actually, uh, this is the relation. So, it's very easy to derive this with some approximations, asymptotic approximation. Or you can make a very complicated thing to get to the same thing, okay? And so this is the well accepted relation. And I want to focus on this particular case, okay? So my frequency representation of Zip's law, and now this uh, ensemble Hibbs law, okay? And see what happens there. <laughs> and in this case, I have a problem because. In this setting where I have a collection of documents, my exponent for Zip's law will not be constant to begin with. Right? So if I take all project Gutenberg, my exponent fluctuates, okay? So this thing is not fixed. So then what do I do here? I don't know, right? But still, you see it doesn't match because this is well, I mean, this is just an informal argument, but still it doesn't seem to match because this is Two around two, okay. But the alpha here, where I here I'm restricting to books where the power law holds from n equals one, okay. And so if I fit something here, I get zero seventy nine, which is not what is this is predicted here, okay. It doesn't really match, you see. So alpha should be gamma minus one. But sorry, sorry, how you are fitting this square? Here, yes. But this is, wait, this is a scatter plot. This is L and V. What, 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 what do you, how do you fit this? It's not, it's a function at most, you see? It's not a, well, I don't know how do you, 
So this is a functional relation between the length and the vocabulary of many documents. Okay. So kind of, this is in log log. Well, we can discuss later, but it depends on, on your, your generative process. So you are here essentially saying that your <coughs> observations are each book, that you are right, and the, the, the fluctuations you expect are independent of vocabulary. But if we connect these two things under some Poisson process as, as we did, then uh, it, this is not the right thing to do, because then your expected fluctuations on the right side are much smaller than on the left side, and you should take yeah. that into account. So just but but they don't have any generative process. I know, I'm just, just asking to, uh, to understand. So I'm, I look at the data, and I don't need to make a hypothesis. This is data, this is many books, I feed the exponent many times. No, oh, but that's the point. When you feed, you are making a model. So you, you cannot separate the, the model from hypothesis. When you are feeding, you are making a hypothesis that your observations are independent, that, that the fluctuations right. are, are right. these. When we are fitting on the left, you are assuming that your frequencies are separate, independent, and so on. Yeah, right? yeah. So there is no, no free. Okay, I agree with the thing that I, I assume independence when I fit. Okay, fair enough, yeah. But it's fair enough to make independent models and compare these formulas. I think this is a valid experiment, but there are hypotheses underlying, right? Yeah, 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 fair enough. Uh, yeah. However, the part of the motivation is, is, is to ask why is this, uh, you know, relation, you know, reported once and again and again and again. I, I don't care how they get to that point, but to begin with, the data doesn't seem to show. And I'm sure in these derivations they assume independence as well, and so the, and then this comparison makes sense. And I'm saying this well-known relation doesn't hold a, a thing. Right, it doesn't seem to fall here. And I will carry on, otherwise I don't finish. Uh, this is just something that I have not finished, but if actually you get this data, okay. So this is the same data. Uh, here I, I filter the books a little bit more, okay. And you see Jib's exponent is, is in black here, okay. So I will color this thing now according to the exponent of Jib, okay. And so Look at this. This is, I don't know what to do with this, okay? So, you say, you see that they are, I don't know, okay? So, they, they seem to be disposed in, in power loss, depending on Jib's exponent. If you make beans of Jib's exponent and, and, and separate them, you see that you get all this power loss. So, what do you do here? One thing you can do, and this is not finished, but one thing you can do, say, I will make a different feed for each beam of Zip's exponent, okay? I have this mixture of exponents, and now I will say, no, no. Okay, all the books with 1.9, I will make one feed for each dog, okay? If I do this, what I get is even more, but I don't know, this could all be a problem of the fitting, or, I mean, it's not really something finished, but if I do this, so for each Gibbs exponent, I fit uh, the Gibbs exponent in the ensemble, I get this thing, right? So this is the prediction, and for when, when the exponent is more than two, you should get uh, linear scaling. And we get this, I get this, and I, I don't know what's going on here. But anyway, so if you are more careful about the thing that you have heterogeneous Gibbs exponents, it doesn't work anyway. It should be here according to the classic uh, derivation. So, <coughs> same thing, sliding window. Okay, so <coughs> so it seems like that this doesn't hold. Uh, could be cherry picking. I'm choosing books with a perfect power law. I thought this was, you know, the opposite. You know, choosing the books that at least where this hypothesis, the starting point, is true, but. There could be something uh, with the fitting method, or perhaps the, the continuous assumption is not okay. It was very sensible to rare words, and so. But anyway, this is a. Uh, uh, so, sorry, quick question. So you yes, yes. you took all the books, or only the, those that test the test? Those that pass the test. So you see, I say cherry picking because who knows what I think. What I'm doing is the opposite. Thing. I'm just going to look at the books that really pass the test. So these are real books, but with a really very nice power law. 
and this doesn't hold anyway. <coughs> so I think this this one we can remove. <coughs> and now I look at this one, okay? So my frequency representation of Gibbs law uh, and the Gibbs law when I talk about the growth of a single pool. So all these pictures, all these plots of bending curves, okay? So the thing is, if you assume a perfect power law for the frequencies, what happens with the particular growth for a single pool? <coughs> and again, so you take an example, okay, Moby Dick, you see, I have this bending, okay, and this is a good power law, it's not perfect, but it's not that bad, okay, and what's the problem? You can say, ah, you see, this, this is not right, you know, this is deviating from the, your assumption, so perhaps the bending is because of this, so you cannot really conclude anything, and what I did is very stupid, so I said, okay, I will create my, my books, yeah, okay, so I create books with a perfect power law, okay, and then look at the growth, and if you do this, so I get the same bending again, you know, so at this point, I said, okay, we, we should be able to compute this thing, this is not complicated, I know everything, you know, I create the book, I know the distribution of the frequencies, <coughs> uh, and yeah, this is a simple calculation, okay, uh, you basically count up to the, my current length, small l, how many words, I have not seen so far, what's the assumption I'm, I'm ordering the words randomly, okay? Yes. Yeah, so we are sampling from our model, yes? Yeah, I'm sampling frequencies, this is a good point, okay? I sample the frequencies, I create the book, and then I shuffle all the words, yes. and then I compute the growth, okay? Yes. So, so you can yes. make this... So this has been also rediscovered a few times. Yes? So, yes. Great. And, and so you get this bending, or you get a you power get rule? You get this bending. You get you get very good approximation of the Hibbs law. Right from from the from the empirical law. Good. So you know if I even, have it's even better if you if you not plug plug the, here the power law, but the but the empirical distribution of this, and you you can recover right perfectly the Hibbs law. Yeah, right. Great. So in that case, in this experiment, we still have a power law here. Of course, if you plug in the but uh, here I'm, I'm creating my artificial books, let's say, right? Yes. So this is what was an experiment to see if the bending, if we could compute the bending. Yes. So you didn't know, if I had known, you know, half of my PhD. <laughs> so you do this calculation, you get this polylogarithm function and so on. If you also add the, 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 you know, the maximum frequency, it gets a little bit better, okay? I will just show how it looks. So, yes. You see, as you were saying, you recover the bending, okay? And you see, my, my, my question was, why, why do we insist in saying this is a straight line if with simple assumptions and some calculations we, we, we get this, this bending, right? And then what happens with real books? Uh, so, of course, this is fabricated books with real books. Uh, it works anyway, okay? The problem with real books, so there's two assumptions and you know, we can solve this one because we can get books from the Project Gutenberg that fulfill the law very well. So uh, we, we, we still have this problem, okay? But anyway, so what we get these books, we I focus on three sets of exponents here. And and that's the result. So here what I'm doing, I'm picking books with Gibbs exponent very close to 1.82 or 2.2, okay? So it's exactly the same thing as before, but now the data is real data. Of course I'm cherry picking it, but that's the point in part. And you see that sometimes you will need to use this more uh, detailed calculation, but <coughs> we recover the bending. So I didn't know that this was known. I, I, I'd like to see the Yes. The references there. But what that, my point was that uh, all these plots of bending curves that we keep saying there's a power law, I think we can describe with this function and there's no need. So why is this working? So it's very simple. Uh, the point, so why is this still working? If you look at the inter distribution of words, okay, 
we know that you have long range correlations and so on, okay, so it's not exponential. So this is the interoccurrence distribution for the real book, so we have this departure from the exponential. And in green we have the shuffled books and so we get Poisson. What is K here? Right, but K is an index indexing which intervent time I'm looking at, okay? Okay. And so K one means the first one. Okay, it's a it's kind of different because it's from the beginning of the book till the first appearance. Okay, and this is just a qualitative argument, but what you see is that the first appearance of a word behaves uh, like in the random book. The others, the first one has no one to cluster with. So, <coughs> so there's these long range correlations, but. Actually, if you look at Hibbs law and you look at the first appearance of each word, that's what you care about, uh, it behaves as in a random book. It doesn't really matter if there's correlations later. <coughs> and this explains in part why, why the derivation where some randomness works well. Uh, And so, I think I'm finishing. So, yes, there's, there's this starting point, and this is the classic uh, solution. And I don't think, you know, with, with all these plots, I don't think that holds. And there's this other calculation, it's quite simple. It's not that beautiful, it's not a power law, but it is what it is, right? And I think this, this makes more sense. <coughs> so, I think. This arrow, we can, we, we could put this, yeah? Oh, there's some, yeah. And the rest, uh, I don't know, still to do. All right, that, that was it. Oh, yeah, see. Okay, I see the previous slide again. You sure? Okay, I was just writing down the formula because it looks very interesting with this polar logarithm function. Okay. Okay. So, any questions and comments? So, my comment is, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, my comment is that uh, this dependence on uh, uh, the, the, this idea of, the, of using the Ernie model to sample the frequencies independently mm -hmm. was actually discovered by Yuzhi Milichka, who mm -hmm. was attending a, a conference Qualico in other mm -hmm. modes. Uh, it was three, three years ago, four years ago. Mishka was presenting that? Yes, Mishka was presenting. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes, and uh, probably I think that works of Maladze and Bayan also show this, uh, also, also, also assume this kind of Ern model. And what is, what, uh, from my point of view, what is very interesting in this Ern model is that it ignores completely, completely the, the, the long-range correlations between words, but still it is able to predict pretty well the vocabulary size. Right. But, yeah. But the, the, so one, one of the things that, that I think Martin was, was telling me is that if you, for instance, compute a pseudo heap law where you count words only when they have appeared five times, for instance, okay, then perhaps things change, right? Because oh. Because it's, let's say, it's very, it's not very wrong to care about only the first appearance. So why do you count the word the first time? Why not the second or, or the third, yeah? You see? I don't know if this has been done, but there is some... It's in the supplementary material of our paper, so Martin. Of our first parents, yeah, so we did. Right, and, and, and so what, what happens then? <laughs> Fits better because you would... Fits better. It says you observe many more times, so you decrease fluctuations. But but yeah, your observation. So the correlations actually, it's, it's, it makes sense, right? That it doesn't really matter the correlations. If you only look at the first comparison, well, that one has no one to, to correlate with. If, so to say, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you think about this clustering, the words have a tendency to, yeah, to come together. It right? is not immediately mathematically obvious to me that that it does. No, it's not obvious to me, but. And then just this is just you know a, a qualitative uh, observation, yes. but uh, yeah. So uh, yes. 
very interesting. So I, of course, have a slightly different view. So I think part of the bending is related to the bending in the Zips law that you also observe, and and that we found that the double power law was a better description. So wait, wait, wait. I think that this part of this bending. Uh, well, this is your model, and I with not, the data you see. Yeah, the data bending. Yeah, that's that's the first comment. So yeah. you think part of this bending. Exactly. Yeah. And this is where when we uh, did the second and third appearance uh, models, uh, the, the the bending was reduced, but and the third and the uh, transition to the second power law was way more clear. Yeah. But so can I ask, uh, for instance, in a short book like? <coughs> That this is not very short. Anyway, in a short yeah. book with 5,000 words, where second regime, I don't see no, second okay. regime, yes. then there is no, or maybe yeah. there, there is no opportunity for, for this bending to be, right? right. Yeah, but that's why I'm saying some part of the bending. I'm ah, okay. it's explaining everything, but I think okay, okay. So part of the bending for longer parts uh, for can yeah. be related to that, that's my view. But I'm, I'm not saying that no, it is not a combination of the two effects. Okay. Okay. So, and a, a second comment only is that when you were testing the Zips law, you are testing a model where you are sampling frequencies. Yes. Right? So we are sampling frequencies of word types. Yeah. And the connection to the to, to Zips scripts, you are assuming uh, the independence of word tokens. Right? So it's a different model. So, so and that is maybe why uh, this and I'm not really surprised that even though when you say Zip's law is valid, mm -hmm. you are testing one type of hypothesis uh -huh. and you are using a different type of hypothesis. So yeah, I'm not, I don't think it's necessarily a contradiction or not even very surprising that uh, then in, in, when you see these things in the Hips picture, mm -hmm. uh, they are not working anymore. That's what just, right. that's my interpretation of the results. But it's no, my, my, my point is that, you know, if I assume a power law in frequencies, that, that's one option. And another option is, is to assume power law in ranks, for instance. And so these are different things because these are different representations, they are not equivalent. If I assume power law in frequencies and create the books this way, there is a landing and we describe it and, and that's it. And part of my point general is all these words that you know don't specify really what these keeps zips and so on and derive this relation. I think we can do better, and so we, we do different things, right? I agree with that. Yes. So we agree. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? So, uh, in the first part of your talk, a beautiful talk about the scaling, you mm -hmm. introduced the G functions, and you have any? Uh, maybe I overlooked something. I missed something, but Google you, Google. yeah, but. Can, can, do you have any ideas what those G functions could be? Well, right. So let's get to the points. Yeah, so there, are, there have been so many models, right? And if you fit it into the scaling um, story, what would you present as these, these G functions? Right. So this is the, the problem, right? To be honest, I, I don't care. You don't care. <laughs> okay. Not, not a little bit, yes, but not that much. Okay, because because of this problem that we are talking, you know, that with large data you will always reject if you propose a function with one parameter, you know, it's always going to fail. Okay, and if it's a if your data bends a little bit, then you can try. I don't, I don't see really the point of, of saying it's way good, it's an stretch exponential and, and fighting forever about this, you know. Uh, we know that it, it changes from book to book, from author to author, from language to language. It is not universal. I, I'm sorry, the, 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 the dream of universality in this sense of saying it, that it's a perfect power law with a unique exponent and so on, is. We know that's that's not. Yeah, like that. but I think it's well, if this. you are trying to relate the Zips law and Hibbs law, then it's better to have this in mind and try to relate the Hibbs law the whole thing, right? Yeah, but that's the problem. So if, if the data is not really a power law, then either you do an exercise of 
putting a theoretical distribution and computing the growth of the vocabulary, and, and this is, you know, homework for you to do and expand, and, and it's good to do it properly. Mm. But then, if the data is not a power law to begin with, I don't know. Then yeah, we have so the data, and it's good. Right? What's here? No. No, no, go please, ahead, please. Go ahead. Yeah, it seemed like that you had a very nice modification for the first part, and the second part you seem to return to this whole thing, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and yeah, I just you're thought right. that it was a bit. Um, no, no, you, you're right. Yeah, but maybe you were, or it's an ongoing work. And so no, no, you, no, you're right. I mean, some, yeah. But for instance, this thing, without telling you what is G, I can tell you that if you think that G is a power law, then I say your exponent cannot change with sample size, for instance. I don't know what is G. You know, they are the ones saying, it's a power law that changes the exponent with the sample size. They say, well, no, I don't think so. You know, then in one book, perhaps you can say, oh, this book is a power law. Very good. And another book, you can say, it's a express, exponential. Okay, you know. I, it, I don't know whether you can if, if I can try to answer the question, yes. I would say that Adobe Power Law would be a good model for that. Adobe Power Law. Mm -hmm. Like the ones right. that well, yeah. Eduardo and Martin went shown, that's all. Double power, power is, like this. Is, is good? good? A good okay. model. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yes. Wow. Where is the double power law? Well, anyway, yeah. So for very large corpora, double power law seems to describe the data very well. It's the simplest thing that, that seems to work. And yeah, I'm happy with that. But, you know, that's the thing. You reject it anyway, right? because of the data, and so, I don't know. Yeah, but, well, please. No, no, I just really would like to add something. Uh, please, well, please, please. In, in your beautiful papers with this collapses, yeah. uh, maybe it's only a visual illusion, but I, <laughs> I see uh, two power laws, but maybe with a slight uh, bending sometimes. Uh, so you, you see two power laws? This is what I remember from, from doing some of your work. Uh, right. Maybe it's wrong. It's no, maybe no. I should look more for more data. But I wonder if these two regimes uh, can. I mean, depending on the I don't know, whatever. <laughs> maybe you don't see them clearly because the the second exponent yes. is. Um, uh, I, I mean, well, depending. Run no, or frequency. I totally, I totally believe this. I, I think that when you have a large group, you start to see the second regime, and that's why your fits are wrong because you know it's bending. And so, actually, if you think about it, the larger the group. You know, the the more your wrong power law starts to move like that, and this really feeds this idea that the the sample size affects the exponent, and so that makes sense to me. But then the thing is, okay, so it's a double power law. It's not a power law, and, and let's just stop, you know, saying that the exponent changes with sample size. It's just a wrong hypothesis, you know, that we insist with it. You see what I mean? So, no. wait, I will, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm over the next speaker. Uh, just one second only. Where is, where is the power law? I don't find it. So, just very fast, okay? What do you have? These, okay, double power law and you don't really see everything, and you start insisting in, in fitting here, okay? When you do the fit here, you get one exponent. When you see a little bit, or a longer group, your fit, which is wrong, but anyway, will be like this. And when you see it more, you, your fit will be like this, okay? So your exponent is getting smaller. So when I increase L, yeah, if, I, if I increase L, which is what you observe, yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. that, that that makes sense. You know, mm -hmm. it's not really a straight line. It, it's just in the mm -hmm. beginning when you start getting to the second regime. You see, your feet, your exponent starts to depart, and you know it goes from two to one point seven, whatever. But but then there's not a, there is not an exponent. You know, it's it's wrong. Well, I mean, your your feet. You should reject the hypothesis probably. <coughs> so I think people have been using less careful fitting and have been accepting exponents that that are not. And and that that explains why there's this drift. And and that's alright if Zip did this because 
the guy was counting words by hand and so on and, and fine. But I think that 2017, we can do better <laughs> with computers and everything. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah. Okay, thank Sorry. you. Let's <laughs>